got a chunk of trash that's anything larger than a micron, it's potentially going to hold the needle valve open. You're going to flood the cylinder with a bunch of white smoke and fuel. What is going on, Diesel Nation? We're excited to have you guys with us today on the Diesel Podcast. If you're watching this on YouTube and aren't subscribed, make sure and click the subscribe button, like, comment. Let's know what you think about the episode. If there's a particular guest or topic that you'd like to have on, we'd love to see your guys' feedback on there and then be able to make them into future episodes, getting your questions answered. Today, I'm going to be joined by Lenny from Dynamite Diesel Products, and we had a listener message in, and he wanted to know what a perfect injector install would look like what are things that should be done what are things that we should avoid doing so we don't contaminate the new injector set so lenny's going to be on he's going to answer that question also tell us about some really cool things that he's working on at dynamite diesel before we get to it though i want to remind you our friends over at kershaw knives have a 20 percent off site-wide code for you use code diesel 2023 at kershaw.kaiusa.com it's a great way to save some money get some really cool gear so if you need a knife for hunting fishing edc something around the job site we've got a ton of different choices for you 2023 has been a huge year for product releases one of their newest are the duralock models which the blades made out of d2 steel there's different choices for blade shape handle handle design um, and the way that the blade opens and closes keeps your fingers away from the blade so it's a super sweet setup definitely make sure head on over check them out and use code diesel 2023 if you're in the market all right let's get to today's podcast with lenny from dynamite diesel products and asking what does a perfect injector install look like Lenny, welcome to the podcast. Look forward to chatting with you today. You've been uh, really busy. I've seen uh, pictures of you at some dyno events and traveling, and it's like, where, where's Lenny been the last couple of months? Seems like you've been working on some cool stuff. Yeah, well, Skyler here in the shop, you know, he, uh, he's got a pretty good run truck, so we've been to a couple of NHRDA events, and that's been really good to see NHRDA uh, kick off again and get moving. So we did some of that, and yeah, we did, uh, did Gomer's. Uh, event the U.S. Diesel Parts Five Valley Rally. Um, we we enjoy those guys. We enjoy that's uh, that's at a place called the Jack Saloon out in Montana. The event is amazing. The people are a ton of fun. So we go to that. Um, and then yeah, we're we're you know with the new things that the company is working on, we're planning on doing the ADS show Association of Diesel Specialists. So we're going to have a booth there, and I guess we're doing a booth at the PRI show as well. So kind of kind of new for us in a way, but with us getting into the nozzle manufacturing game and with us partnering with so many uh, manufacturers around the planet and then distributing for them, we're going to have a lot of products for, you know, Cummins ISX-15, Car 13 um, John Deere, uh, you name it. We're going to be able to provide like injection parts for, you know, stock flowing parts, but man, you got to keep America running, right? So yeah. We're trying to get into that all together, and, uh, and I'm, I'm feeling really good about that because the crew, my crew at Dynamite is epic. Like, they're just stellar humans. Everybody here works with passion. Um, I couldn't be more proud or more happy of every single person that works here. It's And we just picked up. I had Brian Bailey. He was here about six years. He left and, uh, you know, chasing the American dream. He wanted to make some big money, so he did some home lending stuff. And, you know, when things were awesome, like that was a really good gig. You made good money. Uh, and now that, you know, homes and interest rates have changed and prices of homes are having to drop, that he's not writing near as many loans. So he's back. And, uh, you know, what's good about our industry is we may not have the highest profit margins of anything else. You know, I'm sure that tech is a, a much higher profit margin. Uh, medical is a much higher profit margin. But we have consistency and if you're not building thousand two thousand horsepower hot rods you're having to fix dpfs egrs ball joints brakes head gaskets and that money is consistent money and if you do if you run a shop correctly you can make a pretty dang good living and plan for your future uh just doing that kind of stuff so all in all i would say that uh i've been very busy and we're trying to uh, there's, I've got some really good things that I want to talk about during this podcast because sure. we're trying to uh, we're trying to actually help all of our dealer network be more profitable and and just be a better run shop, you know. Yeah, yeah, I definitely want to get to to that part of it, and it, I think kind of a segue with this in the conversation is we'd gotten an email uh, from a listener 
not very long ago. It was maybe a month or so ago. And he said that I, that he works in the aftermarket and in the diesel industry. And he sees a lot where if there's a transmission failure, it's, it's it, like, it's just very common. It's always done where if you have an AC system, go out, you're replacing all these parts. If it's transmission, you're flushing it. Um, cooling system as well. And he said, but I just see so many nightmares. And I'm kind of paraphrasing it, but he just said, I see so many nightmares with injector jobs on common rail systems where there's potentially contaminants left um, in the rail or the lines and different things. He said, can you have Lenny on and him describe to us what a perfect injector install goes like? And I think that's going to be helpful for truck owners out there that are dropping their truck off. It's going to be helpful for um, the shops. And then I think it's also going to segue kind of into that dealer network too, that you mentioned and being able to support them. Because if you're able to do jobs and you know, get them in and out, do the job once, you know, you're maximizing your, your profit, your uh, workload, everything like that. The customer is happy. Um, but I think specifically with this question, it, it's something that I would definitely you know like to hear as well. Cause I don't know all the steps that I should follow if I'm doing injectors, um, either at home or, you know, if I'm taking it someplace, um, what should I expect the shop to do? Um, I would say that anybody who's asking that question is, is, uh, is exactly right. That's, that's definitely suspicions. They need to be replacing or washing ultrasonically everything in the fuel system. So, the the disaster kits like when you buy a Ford disaster kit when a pump blows up you know it's a it's a very expensive job because they're replacing all those parts and I don't know that you have to replace every single part but you definitely should be ultrasound washing every single thing blowing it out um, I can't even say that wiping it out is a good idea because you know here where we're using microscopes and where we're air gauging things when you wipe something down with anything you end up leaving microscopic things that your eyeball can't see behind. And in the needle valve, from the needle to the nozzle, there's one half a degree of opposing angle where the needle comes to, I'm going to use the green screen right here right now, which that's why I'm sitting in an awkward position today is because I want to use that green screen. But basically where the needle valve comes in and it closes inside the sack or the VCO, there's only one half a degree of opposing angle and those two opposing angles meet and they close things off. Well, if you've got a chunk of trash that's anything larger than a micron, it's potentially going to hold the needle valve open. You're going to flood the cylinder with a bunch of white smoke and fuel on any common rail because your common rail is applying pressure to all six injectors or all eight injectors at once. And if there's anything lifting the needle valve, it's going to flood the cylinder. So, yes, it is hypercritical to wash everything, ultrasound it, blow it out, and make sure it's dry, make sure it's clean. And, again, I don't even know if trying to wipe the thing out is a great idea because the stuff that your rags leave, probably bigger than the one to two micron. Micron's 47, 48 millionths of one inch. You're never going to see anything that like with an eyeball. So I would say use compressed air make sure that the shop air system is clean and uh, blow it all out at minimum. But yes, we advise if you cannot wash it ultrasonically, you send it out, get it cleaned ultrasonically or replace it. I can see two, two situations where this might veer off a little bit. So one is if you're doing injectors, either because you want to upgrade, you need a little bit more power or maybe you got a ton of miles on your truck, but you haven't had a fuel system failure and you're saying, Hey, I'm having some work done on the truck. Yeah. Let's throw you know, six or eight new injectors in versus the guy who's had a catastrophic failure with a CP4, maybe something else in the fuel system that has happened, which might dictate whether you're just going to replace a bunch of parts, um, the lines, the rail, you know, other things related to the low pressure. Um, fuel system versus somebody who's just doing it, like I said, because they want a little bit more power or it's, there hasn't been a failure yet. So I think the cleaning versus replacement might be where maybe somebody's got questions, you know, on that. Is it, is it better to just replace some of those other, other smaller components? Or I imagine maybe even trying to clean them that way might be tough for some shops or, or some people to find. 
uh, ultrasonic machines can be bought on Amazon for 150 bucks all day, every day. And for most homeowners, you know, when we were using $150 sonic machines, they didn't last very long. We might get a month or two out of them because we're using them basically day in and day out every single day. So we're now using, you know, $7,500 machines that work better and they've got filters on them. So as the water gets pumped through the machine, it goes through a filter and it captures, you know, anything over five micron per se. Uh, it still looks murky and dirty, but, and then we've got a company called Safety Clean that comes and grabs all that water from us because we're producing so much. But the average guy at home or the average shop that's going to use an old sound machine just for injection components, you know, if you've got two, three, four mechanics and they're all doing head gasket jobs and injector jobs, you could get away with one batch of water with some, we use Omega Sonic soap, and you could get away with that for a week, no problem. Um, a couple of key things to note that we've learned over the years is the soap, if you crank up the temperature, you end up destroying the soap in just a few hours. So the soap no longer works. So you don't want to just crank it all the way up. And the lower the frequency of the ultrasonic machine, the more violently it cleans parts. But if you try to put something in there that's electronic, then you destroy it. So you'd want a really high frequency ultrasonic machine for anything electronic. And it is more gentle and easier on the part, but it does a, uh, it would take more time to clean it if get it clean at all. So example would be if you put an engine block in a low frequency uh, ultrasound machine, you'd get it out really clean very quickly. And if you put the same engine block in a high frequency machine, it would take forever to get it clean if ever it got it 100% clean. So, you know, just depending on the parts you're washing, make sure that you, uh, that you purchase the right frequency of machine for what it is you're doing. And uh, yeah, I, I would have to say that any shop that you're going to, or if you're going to be uh, ultrasonic machines are awesome because even when I'm at home, working on my lawnmower or my snowmobile or my motorcycle or whatever. When I take a bolt out, I want to put it back in clean, not all greasy and slimy. So for 150 bucks, I've got an ultrasonic machine at the house because my personal feeling is with nuts and bolts, I don't really want to touch them ever again. So almost every single bolt that I handle in any sort of critical situation gets treated with something. It's either oil, uh, anti-seize, or possibly Loctite. And as long as you do that and use a torque wrench, then what you take apart and what you put together, theoretically, should never have to be torn apart or have bolts rattling out of it and falling out. And if you go to tear it apart and use anti-seize, especially on exhaust you know, parts, anti-seize is wonderful for trying to tear it apart in the future. I think because of the tolerances that you mentioned, it's so crucial to follow the advice that you gave because I'm sure there's a ton of times over the years that you've had a shop or a customer call you and there was something that wasn't clean during the install and now they're chasing an issue or something's happening and they could have avoided it by either cleaning or, or replacing depending on what was going on with the truck beforehand. Yeah. Like that's, it's been 10 years ago, but I have a, uh, a very good customer today and they were upset because we sent them a set of LB sevens. And of course it was on LB7 because, you know, that's the most difficult goddamn truck to work on. <laughs> and they put the injectors in and ran good five, 10 minutes. And then it started misfiring and white smoking and doing all the stupid things. They sent the injectors in. We said, yeah, sure enough, there's debris inside of them. We cleaned them out, tested them, calibrated them, sent them back. And it ran five or 10 minutes. And uh, then the guy's father calls me up and he just chews my ass. And I'm like, look, man, like, here's the deal. Like, I sent them clean. You want to know how you and I both know that? Well, how's that? Because you put them in and it ran correctly for five or 10 minutes. And then 10 minutes goes down the road and they come back out and I'm going to tear them apart. And I'm going to say, yep, I found more debris. So there's a couple of ways we can do this. One, you can go to Chevrolet and buy a set of LB7 injectors right now. And when it lasts 10 minutes, Chevrolet is going to say, ooh, that's weird. We'll warranty a set out. And you're going to go 10 more minutes and Chevrolet is going to say, ooh, you probably need to wait on warranty. We're going to send these in for inspection. And then we're going to bill you for the two sets that you contaminated. At least I'm trying to help you out. 
But do yourself a favor, pull the fuel tank out, blah, 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 blah. And then I got the whole, God damn it, we did that already. This thing is spotless, spick and span. And I'm, okay, that's cool. But understand, the pictures I'm sending you inside the nozzle, those spray holes are seven thousandths of an inch. The debris that's contamination, you can see, is like very, very small compared to seven thousandths. So unless your eyeball can see smaller than seven thousandths inside of a gas tank, return line, supply line, fuel filter housing, unless you can guarantee that you've seen all that stuff, I'm telling you right now that it's still dirty. Uh, So they took the system apart. They cleaned it all out. They used some alcohol. They blew it all out with compressed air, did everything they could. We sent the injectors back and they were finally happy. So it is, it can be that critical. And an LB7, in my mind, nobody should do an LB7 injector job without replacing the lines because those injector lines are exposed to the environment. Whenever you tear one off, you look inside of it, it's full of rust and you know, road grime and crap from the previous 150,000 miles. It, even when you try and wash those things, you don't really get them clean, clean. And injector lines for that truck are, you know, a few hundred bucks. Just the labor alone wasted on a 10 hour job is more than a few hundred bucks. My mind says if you're doing LB7, you replace the lines every single time. That's good advice. I know he's definitely going to appreciate uh, you okay. answering that and it helps, helps me understand as well. I think a lot of us, because it, they're so critical with the tolerances and it's, it's expensive too when you're buying injectors and, and you're paying for labor. And like you mentioned with the bullet, you just want to do it once. Ideally, we just want to do it one time. So if we can avoid any sort of issues that are preventable, you know, that's yeah. awesome. I, yeah. I, I did want to chat with you. I love doing this every time we talk is about things you're working on, things that are coming up. And I think it's going to tie in with kind of the shop talk and, and cool things you guys are working on in in diesel as well so what have uh what have you been up to since we talked last um well i hired a cfo chief financial officer um fortunately for me because i'm i'm kind of uh uh i speak like john wayne like i'm really abrupt and like i say f a lot and you know i'm you don't really know what everybody's thinking all the time but you always know what i'm thinking so with this girl, she's amazing because she used to be my banker. And after my divorce, like I was flat broke, you know, I owed the government, like things were miserable. And uh, basically I was looking for a new bank and I invited her to my shop. Uh, her and another gal came out from the same company and uh, they walked through my shop, kind of did a tour with me. I felt really good about it because it seemed to me like they had a genuine interest in my company. And, uh, because she was a branch manager at that point, she was pretty sharp through the years. I lost her as my branch manager and she became kind of a region manager. Then later on, she was responsible for a whole bunch of branches in a very, very big, uh, city and then controlled another city next to it. So she had a lot of branches under, and then that brand, that, uh, that company name was that company purchased another company. The new company got to keep their sign uh, on the street, you know, the pole sign, basically. She lost pride in the company. And then because of the way the feds are changing rules, basically, on the daily, she gets an, a memo and says, you know, we need to change where we're doing this. And then a week later, you know, that memo's made it down through the, the tree. People are now following new rules. And a week later, she's getting chewed out for somebody that's following last week's new rules because they've already been replaced this week. And with the way that was happening, she just decided to pull the parachute and uh, kind of halfway retire. So she reached out to me, offered me to become a CFO. And at first I will tell you this, like it sounded very expensive and it sounded unaffordable. So, you know, since I've known her for 12 years, I asked her if she would mind doing a contract for six months. And again, the wage sounds expensive. But we agreed that we would do a six-month contract. That way, if I felt value in it, I would continue using her in the future. And if I didn't feel like it was valuable enough, then I would go back to same old, same old, the way we'd already done it. We're still in our first six months, but we're definitely going to continue this for the future. So she's agreed that she'll be staying on full-time. I have agreed that we're going to continue paying her full-time. 
she works remotely, but my bookkeeper now has a coach. So the daily bookkeeper in most of our companies, you know, most shops are smaller. I think we've got 16, 17 people now. Most of our customers have shops that are five, six, seven people. And because of that, we get trapped in this like hustle and the hustle keeps us going with so much chaos and, and suffering that we don't look at forward planning and things like that. So the girl that, you know, girl or guy that's doing our daily books is trapped in that same cycle and we're not looking towards the future. So with Rebecca coming on, I've always had this idea that if you really wanted to build up like a loyal uh, client base, you would not only teach them how to sell your parts, but you would teach them how to make money. And when an injector fails, who cares? If the relationship is so strong and so stable because I've used my company and all of its assets to help you, the shop owner, maintain, grow, and become very successful, when an injector fails, you have loyalty to our company and our establishment because we've taught you how to be profitable. We've So basically this year, we're, we're going to start doing an injector class. And that injector class is going to incorporate um, your salespeople, your shop guys to be in our injector shop, learning how to do injectors and what we do with injectors. And at the exact same time, Rebecca is going to be here and she's going to be teaching things like accounts receivable, accounts payable, uh, administrations, how to set up policies, why to set up policies, uh, future planning, retirements, uh, how to shop for insurances, like all the things that Lenny's not good at at all. Rebecca is going to be specializing and teaching that stuff to whoever your person is that's kind of in charge of the books at your company. And to be eligible for that, you just got to be one of our dealers. And you don't have to be direct with us. If you buy from XDP, Premier, Turn 14, uh, Thoroughbred, Diesel Power Products, whoever you buy from, if you're buying Dynamite Diesel Product and you're buying through one of our WDs, then by all means, you're still welcome. So we're going to announce that class and when it is, because like I say, Rebecca works remotely. Uh, she currently is living on one of the U.S. Virgin Islands because in her life, she was able to uh, save up enough money to buy some properties. And then they're basically their Airbnb and properties out now. So that's her retirement plan. And uh, so she flies in to see us physically for about seven days every six to eight weeks. And yesterday when I spoke to her about this idea, she thought it was a great idea. So we're going to schedule that with her, schedule it and give an opportunity. I'll probably invite in, you know, 10, maybe 15 shops maximum. And then we'll host two sets of classes, like one for, you know, shop guys, shop gals, one for, you know, the, the people behind your books and uh, the people running your company. We're just hoping that everybody, this, this industry, you know, like I grew up in this industry, my father is a mechanic. And he worked his ass off like that guy, blood, sweat, you know, busted knuckles, all of it. Um, Caterpillar scrapers to Honda Preludes. He worked on everything. And I was there for a lot of it when I was a kid. Um, the work that he did was amazing, especially in the situations that we had to do a lot of it in. But the savings and the business side of things, that wasn't my dad's specialty at all. So he hustled and he had some nice toys through his life. But in the end, you know, he passed away at 54 and I was pretty blown away when he passed. The The savings wasn't there that I thought he'd had. Um, and I'm worried about all of the shop owners that have kept me in business for the last 23 years. Uh, I'd like to help those guys make sure they've got good futures. So so we're just going to host this class and try and, you know, get them to where their, their future is actually planned out. That's what I hear from a lot of uh, shop owners that are, well, I, 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 I was just going to say new, but it's not just new. But one of the things they struggle with a lot is that business side of it. And I think because you have a specialty and you have a talent and skill set, and it's that chaotic, that, that chaotic environment that you mentioned, and it's so hard to be able to step back and look at it, that some of the business stuff falls to the wayside, whether it's communications or finances or marketing or how different departments talk with each other. Cause you're still, you're trying to keep a business profitable. So I've, I've never heard of anything like this. And any of the chats I've had with people is, 
investing in that. They always ask us to try to cover it. And sometimes we can different parts of it, but it's so comprehensive. It would be like you mentioned a whole seminar and, and there's so many sides to it. So I think that's, that's something that's really awesome for companies that are out there to take advantage of. What What's epic about Rebecca is the fact that she was my banker. So when I first met her, man, I tell you what, like this is a super shady story, but I had this lawyer. He was my tax lawyer. And this guy calls me up and uh, he says, I need you to come to downtown Seattle and in my building, which this building was probably, you know, 30, 40, 50 stories tall. Uh, I believe he was on the 14th floor. And uh, to get in the building, you had to go through the guards. You had to have an appointment. And then once you got up to the floor, you had that, they would buzz you in. And then you were in his office. And if you needed to go to the bathroom, they would give you a key with like a one foot wooden stick. And then you could walk down the hallway with the key, get into the bathroom, right? Like it was, it was downtown Seattle. It was not safe. He calls me one day and says, Hey, uh, I need you to meet me in the building. But on the second or third floor, there's a laundromat. And I want you to meet me in the laundromat. And I'm going to introduce you to a friend of mine. And uh, here's what's going to go down. I'm like, all right. So I drive down there and, you know, this guy's my lawyer. So I don't, I don't think anything about it. I sit down at this laundromat and him and this dude walk in here and he goes, Hey, this is my friend. My friend is going to, uh, he's going to start up a uh, uh, company that's going to do all your advertisements while you're going through this tax battle with the government. And I'm like, dude, I don't have any money for advertisement right now like i'm he's like no no no. you're gonna spend money on advertisement and then on the back side you're gonna buy this advertising company and i thought this seems shady af so i didn't agree to it i left the meeting and i called rebecca because you know at the point she was my new banker but she was probably the smartest money person i knew and I, I actually had really good trust in her. And I call her and I tell her this. And she goes, oh, hell no. Oh, absolutely. Lenny, you'll go to prison. That is like tax evasion. There is some shady shit going on. You give me 10 minutes and I'll find you a real lawyer because this guy is not a real lawyer. This guy is a crook. Stay away from him. Don't go back to his office ever again. I'm like, all right. She found me a real lawyer. And that guy started giving me direct answers. And it, it really, I learned then that just because you're a professional person that has a degree doesn't make you honest. So due to that, I went to a real lawyer. He called in all my records and had a very brief conversation with me. His name was Derek. He was a very professional guy. His office was very clean and nice and tidy. And uh, he got me on the path to fixing all of my problems immediately when I put the other cat for like years. And it just seemed like no matter what I did, I could never do any right. So with her help in that, and then watching her build my credit score, not, not her, but like if she said jump, I just asked how high. If she said sprint, I just gave it everything I had. And that's been going on for, you know, like I say, 12 years probably now. Um, that being said, with her knowing that side of the money so well and her being a banker, we shop owners, we job shops, we need coaches and a lot of us like some of my best friends are in this industry and they own shops they're amazing technicians they can do things with their hands that you know nobody can't but they don't have that coach so i see this pretty often it's very unfortunate um good friend of mine brian howell the owner of power products him and i talk and we share stories and good ideas and bad ideas and things like that. And uh, he, he got a CFO before I did. He's got a bigger company than I do. So he installed the idea that I should do the CFO thing, even though I was so scared to do it. And when I did it, one of the things he said is, at first, it's a little frustrating because like we're used to doing things like, I've got cash flow, I've got money, I've got a good credit score, and I want a install, you know, like I, I want a new Razor. I want a new boat. I want a new motorcycle. I want a new hot rod car. I want I want to spend $100,000 on building a sled pull truck. But if your CFO, if you emotionally are trying to drive your cash flow off the emotions, 
you're not going to optimize where the cash flow can be key. So Brian told me, he's like, at first, it's a little frustrating because they pull the reins in 100% and tell you to go on a cash diet and that nothing can really be spent. And then once you start to really show profit, all of a sudden, six months down the road, they're telling you to go buy things and showing you why you're buying things. So sometimes it's not that you're not making enough money. Sometimes it's the fact that the money you're making needs to go somewhere else for a, a period of time, but it changes the rest of your life. And I can tell you right now, man, like when I'm walking through the grocery store, when I come into work, you know, these guys, I walk in the building some days and, and I've just spent the last, you know, two hours in the morning thinking and then 20 minutes on my way to work and I'm worried sick about whether it's payroll or taxes or a customer or a whatever. I was always concerned about something. And now it's a lot less concerning. So I just walk in in a better mood. You know, hey, guys, what's up? How's everybody doing? I'm, I'm in a lighter mood. I'm in a freer mood. Because the questions, and I knew that as long as I was standing in front of a calibration stand or an EDM or a dyno or doing whatever it was that Lenny does, I wasn't watching the money. I wasn't making policies I am silly, but, you know, this week she's like, hey, we need to update all of our uh, credit applications to all of our open accounts. And I'm thinking, oh, she's going to love this. <laughs> yeah, we're going to update that because we've never done those. And she's like, my God, Leonard, what are you talking about? I'm like, no, we've <laughs> never. Every account that we've got was a handshake deal. There's nobody on the hook. And she's like, Len, that." Oh, oh no, that's not going to work. Like in the long end, when somebody finally passes away that you're doing business with, there's no legal paper to go to their, uh, you know, whoever's going to handle their estate and say, this person owes me money. So you could be out 20, 30, 40, maybe a hundred grand and you're never going to see it because there was no legal document showing they owed you money. And I'm thinking, oh boy, that's, so it's not necessarily that my buddy would screw me. It's the fact that all of a sudden it goes to the government, it goes to his estate, his family is fighting over his estate, and you know nobody's going to want the, the debt. They're only going to want the assets. And I've got no legal paper showing that they owe me money. So this month, basically, it's, it's early October right now. We're giving everybody the next three weeks to fill out a credit application, and we're going to install the credit terms on that paper. And then November 1st, if we haven't got that application back, which we're not necessarily going to run through a credit bureau, but I need to have somebody's personal guarantee on that piece of paper saying that they owe me money and here's the credit terms. So November 1st, if we don't get those credit letters back, then those accounts get closed. We're just, you know, we're, we're getting to the point where we can't risk that anymore. And and I, you know, I'm talking pretty uh, pretty openly and it's almost embarrassing because I run this thing off of like emotions and excitement. And it seems pretty silly because when a business person walks in, they're like, Oh my God, are you serious with this? And <laughs> you know, a lot of my, a lot of the people that are going to watch this video are much better at business than I am. So they're thinking to themselves like this guy's a return. I got to, you know, click, they change the channel right now, but that's just real. Like I'm, I'm good at what I do and I'm not great at a lot of other things. So here's me. One of the reasons I think this is really, really important is conversations I've had over the last three years with different people in the industry is, you know, 2020 was a massive year for their sales and 2021 was even better. And I've heard from some of them 2022 and 2023 are, are even vastly better than it was three years ago. So I think just from my outside perspective is that there's been more business, there's more profits. Um, a lot of the companies have ramped up with the number of employees, the buildings that they're in, they built new buildings. So there's this, this increased cash flow. And I think it's important to be able to manage it because it one might not always be like that. And you want to be able to sustain, you know, downturns and, and just be able to weather storms differently, but then also manage, you know, some of them have talked about, hundred percent more business than they had in years prior. So it's this huge growth that happened all of a sudden. So I think it's incredibly important what you mentioned to be able to manage that. 
and to have those conversations where, you know, the business person says, how are you doing it like this? You can't do it like this and kind of have those humbling moments. But I think it's going to be incredibly crucial in the aftermarket from the business side. I would, the best thing about this industry right now is the, the auto workers union is currently on strike, right? Yeah. So that doesn't mean that they're not making cars, trucks, Corvettes, Dodge Rams, uh, but they're also not shipping parts out. So for those of us business people that got crafty and creative two, three years ago during COVID, that gives us a leg up because we aren't reliant on just those people to get our parts. As a shop owner, if two and three years ago, you created new pads to get parts, if most people are waiting on the uh, auto workers union to get back to work before you can get parts out, well, you're pretty much screwed right now because it's like opening a bakery with no sugar or flour. But if you're diligent and sharp and think with passion, you'll figure out a way. And those people that get crafty, they will, these difficult moments, uh, that's what separates, you know, the men from the boys per se, because the difficult moments, the ones you really got to gut through example, like we can't purchase uh, injectors right now for 6.7 liter power strokes from Bosch or Ford. All right. But we've already got another guy that we partnered up with. That's decent at remanufacturing those things. He sends them to us. And then we go through, swap nozzles, swap plates, build them to what size we need, and then we ship them out. Is the warranty rate a little bit higher? Yes. But is it better to have a little bit higher warranty rate? Let's call it, like honestly, it's probably uh, it's less than 5%, but the other stuff is less than 1%. So it's amazing when we have it. But right now, if you've got a truck that's stuck sitting somewhere that needs injectors, I'm going to bank on you taking the keys, even if I tell you there's a 95% success rate and a 5% failure rate. We both agree that it's not the best alternative, but it's the best alternative right now. So we're having to do those things. And when we're building back better, it's really expensive. It's just not always better. But man, we got to get crafty and we got to get creative because these trucks just can't sit. Some of these trucks belong to farmers. Harvest is coming. Like potatoes don't give you extra days. As soon as the snow falls, you're screwed. So we've got to keep America running by doing whatever it is we've got to do and just accept that some of these things that we've changed, um, even people that I buy parts from, their, their food chain has changed in the last three years. So some of the warranty rates, we used to buy things from certain places in Italy that were great. And during COVID, the same company was selling us garbage. And we had some that we fought our way through to calibrate and get out the door and they come back into warranties. And it's been pretty maddening because we're doing our very best to make sure that people can get down the road with the best stuff they can. But then we find out, oh, the heat treat was done incorrectly. So the parts didn't last the way that we were used to seeing them last. But then, like, and I, I, I hate to admit this or say this, but in this industry, most of the casting is done in China. A lot of steel comes out of Russia, the Ukraine, China, things like that. So we're having to import parts and then do all the final finish work right here in our building. So, you know, this morning we were having a meeting and and one of my guys, as we're standing there having this meeting, because I've got a good buddy of mine that's very successful uh, with turbochargers, but they're overseas turbochargers he tears apart. He does all his magic too. Those turbos are fantastic. Everybody loves them. But if you really think about it, it could be made in China. But reality is, like, no matter where it's made, as long as the finish work is done right here by U.S. people with passion, you're going to get a good quality part. And unfortunately, like, you know, I'm looking for a new tractor. I bought a Coyote tractor about December, so 10 months ago now. And three months, it's been sitting at the dealership waiting on parts because Korea, they wouldn't ship me a harness. It's been really frustrating. So I'm scared of the tractor and it ran good until it didn't run. I'm scared of the tractor because it's 10 months old and we can't get parts for it. What's going to happen when it's five years old and I need something? So I'm going to punt the coyote and I'm going to buy 
either a Kubota or a John Deere. And I go to the John Deere dealership last night and I'm thinking, man, made in America. Like I, I just, I've never owned a John Deere tractor. My father had a John Deere lawn tractor when I was a little kid. It was a great tool. Uh, and then I look and it's, you know, the pricing is way more expensive than a Kubota. But I'm thinking made in America. Like I should be able to get parts. And I am i don't want to buy any tractor every three years. I'd like to buy this tractor and own it and blow my snow for the next 20, 30 years. So I'm probably going to end up buying something that I can actually get parts for because that's where my head is at now, even though it is a lot more money. So I don't know. We're going to, all of us, we're challenged with things that uh, you buy. I, I shouldn't pull out a bunch more brands, but a lot of the brands of stuff that we buy, the parts all come from China. Might be assembled in the USA, but you can't really call it made in the USA. Look at a snap on ratchet and read what's on the ratchet. Doesn't say anything about China. And all it says is snap on USA. I actually got showed that this morning. Doesn't say made in the USA, but you would assume it's made in the USA. Like it's snap on and they are the, that's the elite hand tool, right? But it doesn't say made in the USA. It just says snap on USA. And one of my guys is like, I guarantee goddamn to you that thing's made in China or somewhere else even worse. I don't know, but here we are. Like it's, as long as it's, you know, finished correctly and done correctly, we're going to keep buying high dollar snap on ratchets because no matter where they're made, they're actually really good ratchets. So, and there's going to be somebody saying, you know, snap on sucks because that's just hater aid, but I, we, we have their ratchets here and they work pretty good. We've chatted a lot over the years about the investment you've made into machines, people, suppliers, <clears throat> tons of things you've done to be able to reach this level where you can do this. And I think that ties back into what you're talking about with CFO managing money in a business as well, is it's the same thing in a different side of the business where, you know, I, I did an episode about the auto strike two or three weeks ago. And one of the parts that we had talked about on there was about the supply chain and it being affected. And then not too long after it happened, yeah, I'd see or hear, you know, some shop owners talking about, oh, I can't get these parts from GM and haven't been able to get it for a while. And I can't get these ones from Ford. So they're talking about it now, but there, there's really nothing you can do at this point. If you're, if you didn't do the prior work, if you didn't set up the systems and get the avenues to be able to, um, you know, get these parts. So I think it's the same thing with the financial side you were mentioning. If you wait till the point that it's a crisis, it's almost too late. And so yeah. doing the work now is better. Yeah. No, there's, you know, one of the, when I was real young, I, uh, I got a job at the Douglas County PUD, Public Utilities District. And, you know, basically we were the uh, electric power company of the Valley, right? So I read meters for a while. I got an apprenticeship as an operator. My grandfather was an operator. And an operator is, uh, he's the guy that sits in a dam does safety clearances before mechanics or electricians can work on things and then turns on the hydroelectric generators and shuts them off. So we have to know all the systems as operators in the entire dam. That job was a very, very good job. And a lot of parts that that dam was constructed out of was made on site in the 40s and 50s and 60s. My grandfather was a machinist that was on that same hydroelectric project. And I had the privilege to meet this fellow named Herb Curtis. He was a very young engineer that was on the dam project when it was being constructed. And then when I sat down for an interview, I told him my name was Lenny Reed. And he's like, ah, yeah, you know, like, uh, you know, you ever hear of Eugene Reed? And I'm like, well, we called him Alan, but that was my grandfather. And he's like, well, your granddad made a lot of work on this dam. I said, no, that'd be cool. Everything was made in America. It was crude, but that stuff's still functioning. And now with blueprints, with, you know, like the Pharaoh arm, with SolidWorks, with all these things, we can do drawings right here in the USA. We can have them made overseas, and we don't need to get them completely finished overseas because, truthfully, I don't trust anybody to do the finish work. But as a builder, I'm not going to be the guy that goes out and cuts the timber 
and then mills it. I'm just going to buy a two by four. I'm going to make whatever I need to make because I'm a builder, right? And here in this shop, like I feel like we're the finished carpenters. We're the guys that are giving you what you finally see, but everything underneath the wallpaper and the paint and all the rest of it is stuff that didn't happen by me. I just want to make sure that the lumber I'm getting is to spec. So we are buying machines that's going to help us build things. We're going to be able to make nozzles in-house within a year. And that'll be fantastic. But we will never be able to keep up with the demand or the, the manufacturing requirements for everything that everybody needs. But I am a lot better at nozzle inspections than most people. Because of that, I can import parts from all sorts of countries, and it doesn't always have to be China. But there's a lot of countries that are funded. The country basically owns injector places, and they have extremely high quality tools. They've got people with degrees. They've got high educations. They can make really good parts. And we just send them drawings and blueprints asking for us to be the final, the, the final finish. It works out pretty dang good. We're not stuck waiting for something on back order because an example would be uh, the 98 and a half to 2002 Dodge pickup truck. Uh, those are the ISB body, 153 degree spray angle. Um, OEM was a, a VCO seven hole and it works really good. We now have those bodies made. And one of my guys was really upset because he's seen this massive influx of warranty coming in. And I'm like, all right, cool. We have these things called action reports here in this building. You fill out an action report. It stays, whether you're in production or sales or the remand side, each one of those teams has a board. And your uh, action report starts on step one and it moves its way down to where we find the resolution on that board. I don't really care to hear about how many warranties. If we don't have action reports, they're not real. Like you're just angry. You're just upset. It happened to your buddy or whatever, right? But the the bodies, this morning we tallied up and we have sold about a minimum of 7,000, but possibly 9,000 of those bodies. And the legitimate warranties that have came in have been less than 20. The failure rate's almost none. But again, we're doing the final finish work right here in this house. We're doing the EDMing, we're doing the AFMing, and we're doing the pop testing in-house. Have we thrown away some bodies? Yes, because when we go to put them in the pop tester, sometimes the manufacturer didn't get the feed hole correct. And because of that, we couldn't even get them in the pop tester. So we throw the body away, and I don't cry about it. It's because that's part of manufacturing. But when you're dealing with something that's so far less than 1%, it's still a total grand slam. And then reality is, like, when somebody sends in six injectors that are junk, how come you were able to ruin six injectors and everybody else hasn't ruined one? To me, that would be some sort of a debris or a contaminant or something in the fuel that you've got that's ruined the parts. So uh, there's risk and there's reward. Um, yesterday, we got in a dual feed body, which we're having mass produced. And we're going to introduce them at 1750 bucks. And the dual feed body for a 12 valve is, that's a $3,000 to $4,000 purchase everywhere else. The bodies that we had made, you look at the machine work and it's OEM quality. By the time we EDM them and we pop test them and we do all the things, it's an OEM quality dual feed to where everybody else that we're competing against is basically going to John Deere and they're buying a $30 injector. They're doing their own drilling and their own reaming and the whole quality is garbage. So you've got these dual and triple feeds that they don't flow very good because the all of the machining was incorrect. But they're extremely expensive, and I know why they're expensive, because you started with the John Deere body, you send it out to a machine shop, they charge you money, everybody's got big time and big money into this thing, and then you try and chase a bunch of holes, and on the outside, it looks like you got it correct. But because the angle is incorrect on the inside, you might have two spray orifices feeding the outside hole. 
So there's, there's just a ton of messy stuff out there. And my thing is like, if I don't try to at least get on the first base, I ain't never coming home. So if we have problems with these bodies, no big deal. I'll know what those problems are. I'll update the drawing. I'll update the print. I'll request that the manufacturer who's making the body for me changes things and we keep moving. That's growth. One of my favorite parts when we chat is it, this all ties together, but it's with the new things that you're working on with, and we've covered a lot of them before. And it seems like every time, every time we chat, there's something new that you got going on. You'd mentioned those 12 valve injectors, but what are some other things that we should keep our eye out for that uh, is going to improve? Well, there's so much with the trucks, not just our injectors, but the way they run. You've talked about that. Um, how they idle better, how they perform better. People really get interested in that. They think, when's it coming for my truck? When's it going to be available for what I drive? <laughs> um, there's a, uh, give me, give me one second. I'm going to disappear and I'm going to come right back because it's actually funny because yeah, hold on. That, this is different packets of paper that I find on the web and then I print them. And all of these different packets, you know, to be honest, I've got a friend in Australia and he's sharp, real sharp injection analyzer. Like this is a tool for a, it's basically a flyer for a tool that he's familiar with. This guy sends me these emails and there's, there's so much information. There's, there's, there's an overwhelming amount of information. So I, my attempt is to attack one of these packets every week and then come to work trying to employ the ideas that I got out of these. Cause everything here was studied by possibly a university, the U S patent office, Caterpillar, Bosch, uh, ECM manufacturers, like there is a ton of data here. And a lot of it is very outside of my world, but I can bring it into my world. With this much data, this much stuff, um, there's one here about pistons, right? And when I read about piston technology and why they do things in boats that they don't do in pickup trucks, it helps me understand why when people buy boat pistons, there's certain things that just don't work right. And that being said, I come in and I'm thinking, okay, injector wall thickness, like where we, where we EDM through the spray hole, that wall thickness, the thicker it is, the more that the hydromechanical restriction is. So depending on how thick that wall is, if it's 45 thou thick or 50 thou thick, you end up with uh, more or less restriction. But we, like in the farm, the only thing we're measuring is hole size. We're also not thinking about K-factor or surface finish of the wall thickness. So you can get an injector nozzle that has a, an 8,000th hole with really amazing surface finish, and it's only 45,000 wall thickness, and it flows. Then you get something with 12,000th hole thicker wall thickness and a garbage surface finish with no K factor and the eight thou hole kicks that thing's ass. And then you read the internet and there's people like, well, I've got some five by twelves from God knows wherever. And I got some five by twelves from this guy. And I got some five by twelves from that guy. And I'm like, man, those boys don't know anything. Like they, they, all they know is the jab. There's no footwork. There's no dancing. There's no cross. There's no nothing. They just know one term and they think that's the only one that's counting. It's not. Whole configuration, angle, the washer thickness. I mean, there's some of these studies that we do where we're machining like nozzle nuts to try and get the nozzle protrusion into the head a little bit deeper. And it works on the dyno. It works. You drive it. It's happier. It doesn't work on everything, though. So the studies that go into all these papers, like I can read about it. And then I can employ it. You know, we've got a dyno. I've got Mitch out there right now working on our stuff. I spent three days with him. We, 
almost four in December, four years ago, our account governor springs, we had them made and I've had, I've had nothing but misery for like four years now. And I thought, man, my pump guys, just everybody's, they're out to lunch. Like nobody's getting this right. So this last week, I sent the, the, the Governor Springs, well, a couple of weeks ago, I sent the Governor Springs out to Kevin in Northeast. I said, hey, install these in this pump for me. Tell me, thank you. He goes, man, I don't like them. I'm like, what do you like about them? He goes, I don't know. They don't work. I said, all right. Did you try just the idle spring versus the Governor Spring? No, I didn't do that. I said, okay. Thank you for finally telling me you don't like them because everybody else says they work just fine in the stands. But then I tear, I try and drive them. They don't work fine at all. I, I tear them apart and they've got them all set up goofy. Um, start ability wasn't right. They didn't rev up. They didn't do anything right. So then I do a little studying and I try another idle spring and it fixes all of my problems. And I'm super frustrated because on the side of the injection pump, there's some screws that need to be adjusted. And I, Mitch takes the pump out. I lay it on the on the stand, and I'm like, physically, those two screws are definitely in wrong positions. So off of memory, I want to basically take and, and adjust those screws where I think they need to go, and then we're going to set the governor springs up the way I think they need to be set up. We're going to put it in the truck, and this probably ain't going to work because we just changed so many things. But we had we had too many volts on a 12 valve. The, the, the further you step on the gas pedal the more it changes the app sensor voltage. And we had too great of a swing. And as soon as you'd go to wide open throttle, actually at about 80% throttle, it would jump out of fourth gear into third gear and it would unlock the converter. Well, that's not good. You can't go fast in third gear with no lockup. So we end up adjusting all these screws, throwing it back in. I rest my toe on the gas pedal, it pops and lights like it hasn't done in three years. Well, I guess that's good. And then we do the sweep on the voltage for the app sensor, and we discover that this thing's actually way better than it used to be. Still not perfect. So then, you know, Mitch is in there trying to tune on that screw a little bit. We get it to where it's perfect, and now all of a sudden, we the transmission works the way it's supposed to work. Huh. That's good to know. That sends us down some other paths. We spent three days in the dyno room with that truck and discovered that there was a ton of things that we've been doing incorrectly. And I literally, 100% of it was my fault because Mitch is too young to have understood all the stuff that I knew about P-Pumps from 20-some years ago. And I was so busy in the chaos, I didn't give him the time to just say, this week we're going to work on that goddamn thing until it's fixed. And this week we finally did it until we knew that we got the pump right. And then we tested turbos, dryer pressure was 22 pounds. We pulled the fuel all the way back and it made its most power with the least amount of smoke. And I'm like, yeah, no shit. This thing makes lower drive pressure than stock and it's got two turbos on it. So we've got to spin the primary charger along the manifold. We've got to spin it harder. So off with the turbos, order up a new turbine housing. And then I'm like, you know, we're going to try. I've got, I've got turbos here, like drop-in units from the Fleece Cheetah series. I've got a drop-in unit from... Uh, calibrated power solutions and i've got a drop-in power uh drop-in unit from uh power driven diesel like all three of those turbos can easily support 500 horsepower like let's take the compounds off let's put a stock manifold on it because that's what every most people are going to run and let's try this test on this truck with this pump and these injectors and get it to where we know that 95 percent of our customers would be super stoked to own this so that's what we're doing right now is we're, I actually found a stock exhaust manifold that was looked ugly and I can't stand that. So we sent it and got it ceramic coated. Uh, it should be back today. And uh, then Monday we'll be back on the dyno with, we're going to, we're going to dyno all three of those turbos, drive all three of those turbos next week, shoot some videos and start answering questions for people. Because again, this is my fault. I've got a tool called the dyno and I'm not showing enough people that are working on stuff at home. And I hate it when people are like, ah, you know, like what's the best turbo for me? I've got some five by twelves with, and I'm like, man, that guy, I don't care. Like, I don't care what you got for parts. Tell me what you want for horsepower and let me help you with the recipe. But don't tell me you're hungry and you're allergic to all foods. Like, don't tell me what you have for parts 
and then expect me to make a meal out of it. I don't know what you want. So if everybody would just say, look, I want approximately 400 horsepower. I want approximately 600 horsepower. Well, the parts you have aren't even going to fit that. So stop with that. Sell them now. Let's get you parts that are going to go to your goal. I don't really care about horsepower. What the hell are you doing with the truck then? Leave it alone. Well, I want to tow. What do you want to tow? A boat. Is it nine feet long made of aluminum and have like oars in it? Or is it 36 feet long, two stories, and weighs 35,000 pounds? It's kind of a difference. I'd like to know that. Yeah. You think that's – I think we're – you know, with with our chats on the podcast, we talk about that a lot, and I see it with your videos too on your YouTube channel. Is about the recipes. Do you think that's going to be the future of being able to convey this information? Is is my experience? It was always well, I want. It was so hard to get the answer, or or maybe even like for me, I didn't know exactly where I wanted to be, and I made it infinitely more hard on myself and any company I chatted with trying to put together parts like that recipe that you mentioned. So getting us to think about either how we use it, what we want, and then putting all the parts together to be able to achieve it versus the opposite way, which I think is maybe has historically been more common. Um, I feel like people, you know, in every industry, uh, especially like say boats in the marine industry, uh, somebody walks up to a guy and goes, man, that's a beautiful boat. You know, I'd like to buy it. All right. Well, it's like $250,000. Well, how much if you take the engines out of it? Well, first off, it wasn't for sale. I'm not going to pull the motors out of it. And second off, at 250 grand, I've already got it dialed in. It does what it does. No matter what you think you're going to say about building your own powertrain, you know, your own out, uh, out drives and your own engines, by the time you buy my boat and we tear it all apart and you put it back together trying to save $10, you're probably never going to get it dialed in as, as well as I have it dialed in because I've got five or six seasons of getting it straight and square. With these pickup trucks, the, the beauty of every shop owner's life right now is these trucks were made pretty good back when they were new, but not fantastic. And technology's gotten better, so brakes, ball joints, all the steering components, shock absorbers, stereos, backup cameras, remote start, all this stuff can be added to these old trucks. And a new truck, not only is the, you know, the auto workers union on strike, but they're also $100,000. Not many people can swing a payment for $1,500 plus insurance. We have an opportunity as shop owners right now to build some of the most glorious, glamorous, beautiful driving trucks. Ever. And that's exactly what we should be doing is studying if you're going to go to SEMA this year, don't just go for the cocktails and the gambling. Go to look at everybody's new stuff to figure out what you can bring home and take to your shop to make money and make your customers happier than ever. These guys have 20-year-old trucks, and they're more than happy to spend money on them right now because they need to. So in my opinion, I think we're right there right now. That's one of the parts that I... I just, I love it because those older trucks, they, they haven't gone out of style, so to say it's the technology, like you mentioned, is there the, it's just all that you can do with them is so much farther than when they were new or five years old at that point where it, it is hard to go, you know, into a dealer and say, I want to spend over a hundred thousand dollars on this truck. And if you can find the one that you want or you got to wait forever for it to come in <laughs> yeah. where I can, you know, I take this common rail or this Duramax or this power stroke and I can have it do exactly what I need it to do and make more power than a new one and not have those stresses. So I think that's really cool. What I've, what I've seen, especially from you guys is the focus on some of the older trucks. We talked about VP 44. He's talked about 12 valve that LB seven stuff before. So it's everything you're learning now about the, the newer trucks, you're also having available for something that stopped being made in 2002 or, you know, 2007 or even older. Yeah, it's it's a real deal that uh, I got a call coming in. So I got to I got to block this real quick. Well, it ain't going to let me. I hope you can still see. Me. Uh, basically, we just started a new company under the dynamite umbrella. 
And this company's name is uh, uh, Patriot Diesel Products. And the slogan behind Patriot Diesel Products is keeping your legacy alive, meaning your legacy truck. These trucks are 20 years old. Those are legacies. And Patriot Diesel Products is going to be remanufacturing and manufacturing parts in the diesel side of things, on the injector side of things, to keep all those old trucks alive. So an example would be, we just had, uh, we got one customer that wanted to purchase, we were remanufacturing indirect injection forward injectors from like those late 80s trucks, non-turbocharged, but there's none out there. So I reached out to one of my contacts, gave them some of the OEM parts, said, could you make this? Yes, we can make this. How many do you want? We agreed on a number. And basically, we're going to have all of those parts shipped into us, assembled, but not tested. We will do all the testing here in this house. We will put the Patriot name on it after it passes. We will then send it to Power Distributing. Power Distributing is going to be selling to shops to keep all those late 80s Ford trucks alive because the core bank was garbage. Like, first off, those things were made by about four different people. So the shims were all different. Nozzles are all different. The only place that you could get nozzles to reman them wasn't really that great. And we were remanding them for these guys to keep those trucks on the road until I was like, man, we got to do something different. Like we're spending so many hours trying to reman these things. And those are exterior exposed. So they were painted in 37 different colors all the time. We spent way too much time trying to reman and make them look decent. So, hey, let's just let's make a batch. So we made 3000 of those injectors. And that should keep, you know, those old Ford trucks should stay on the road for a few more years just because of that. Well, that is page, and this is a stock flowing part. It's not modified. We're just trying to keep old trucks on the road because there's a lot of Americans right now that can't afford a hundred dollar pickup, period. And besides, who's going to hang a snow plow on the front of a hundred thousand dollar pickup? Nobody that's sane. Like that's wild. That'd just be crazy. Yeah. There's... So a lot of those fans, uh, I did an episode this summer with, with a guy who's had one and he, he loves it. It's, uh, it's an IDI and I mean, he's passionate about it and there's, there's so many of those older trucks that are like that and they yeah. just, they just work like they just yeah. work. They're maybe not as fancy, but you can, you can make them do pretty much anything that you want from a power perspective, efficiency, and they're just so hard to let go of. <laughs> it's just, you just can't let go of them. They're just, it, it was almost <laughs> like. It hit a point where I think it was almost the pinnacle of reliability in a diesel truck platform. I'm not sure exactly what year that happened or what year range it happened, but the market for that is in, it's it's still insane for people buying them, um, investing money in them, and it's it's a huge part of what I see in the aftermarket. It you know what's funny is like my daily is a, a Dodge Ram 1500 with the Echo diesel motor in it, and it's got 220 thousand miles on it. I keep the oil changed in it. You know, it's got synthetic in it all the time. And it's a really, you know, it's a full-size cab. So I can put me and three other dudes in there with no problem. 90% of the stuff that I do can be done behind that truck. Because that truck, you know, like if I go back to, to that indirect injection Ford, like F-250, had 16-inch wheels on it because the brakes weren't very big. They rode like garbage. They got a really good fuel economy because they were pretty light for a three-quarter ton truck. Like the frame was made pretty light. The cab was pretty tinny. They weren't creature comfort yet, but they were goddamn reliable and they'd get 20 plus miles a gallon. Well, you're not going to get 20 plus miles a gallon out of a new truck, but you take my 2012 with a flatbed on it. And that's a crew cab truck dually with 20 inch wheels. Um, and the wheels are uh, uh, Ryan, uh, Husted's wheels from uh, Dually Design Company, so they're a, they're a forged wheel. It's actually pretty light, but that truck empty is ten thousand pounds. I was blown away at how heavy it was. But you're never going to get a ten thousand pound truck to drive down the road and make twenty two miles a gallon. That old Ford or the old Chevy six point five liter that everybody cussed about, those things got twenty plus miles to the gallon forever. Yeah, they were they were good, and if you have a a ranch or a farm or a need for a plow truck, that stuff is still very alive and very good. So yeah, I'm with you on that hundred percent. There's not that I don't love my eco diesel because the eco diesel, it gets good mileage, but it, 
barely gets 20, 24 miles per gallon, and it's basically a stock truck with BF Goodrich all trains on it, stock size. It does drive good, it does ride good, and it does 90% of my stuff. So if Ford, Chevy, and Dodge, Toyota, Nissan are going to do anything, I hope they concentrate on the half-ton market because, truthfully, that little 1500 you know, I've got like a surf boat that's 25 feet long. That little truck tows that boat just fine. Like, I wouldn't want to drive from, I, I wouldn't want to spend 100 miles or 200 miles driving with it. But getting it from my house to the lake, the brakes are great. The steering is great. And it gets it there just fine. I disconnect from it and I can go to the grocery store, wing it into parking lots, no problem. It's a good little platform. And, the, you know, I've got the same platform in my Eco Diesel. Uh, uh, gladiator right now and we're just going to start a video series on that because that thing when i've had two gladiators one that was a gas powered on 39 and a halves and this one with uh basically one ton axles and 41s this thing out wheels the gasser light years the roll on of the torque is superb to the gas powered motor it's not even close so we're just getting ready to start dyno on that and then start working on the injectors for that pretty soon. And it's going to be an emission friendly the vehicle as well, leaving all the equipment in place. We've already, I've had uh, 2015, I had the same motor in a Grand Cherokee. And that thing, I drove about 40,000 miles after we did the injectors, no codes, no problems. It was glorious. So we'll do the same tricks to these injectors. The Gladiator on 41s with one tons is going to draw more attention than any 2015 you know, Grand Cherokee. So I'm hoping to kind of start a little bit of a forest fire with those people and quit deleting all their old trucks because it's just a bad idea. Like all the really good tuners have been pinched and popped. And if you're getting tunes, if you get a tune that's good today, will that guy be around when you need updates? Probably not. So just leave the damn thing alone and let's start working towards the future of using good fun driving vehicles that still have all the emissions gear on them and you know life's going to be good don't forget diesel fans make sure and head on over to kershaw.kaiusa.com use code diesel 2023 for 20 percent off site wide it's a great way to save some money get some really cool gear so if you need a knife for hunting fishing work around the house job site they've definitely got you covered one of their newest models in 2023 are the Duralock models and the blades made out of D2 steel. There's different choices for blade shape, handle design, and the way that the blade opens is really smooth. Keeps your fingers away from the blade when you open and close it. If you're in the market, definitely make sure head on over, check them out, and use code Diesel2023. Also, want to give a shout out to some of our Patreon supporters: Tyler Lona, 23 Diesel, J Cole, John, all of our other Patreon supporters. All of you who subscribe on YouTube podcast apps, follow us on. Facebook, Instagram, TikTok. We appreciate all your support here in your seven of the Diesel Podcast and look forward to bringing you more of the content that you want to hear in 2023. Until next time, keep the shiny side up. 